Hello once again from David DeLima speaking to you from Adelaide here in South Australia. Our message today is entitled Flying the Australian Flag. Flying the Australian Flag. So today we will be looking at five aspects to this whole matter. Firstly, understanding God's interest in the nations and their flags. And then secondly today, interpreting the Australian national flag. And our third matter of concern today, developing respect for Australia's star-crossed federal blue banner, as we may call it. And fourthly today, promoting the Australian national flag. And then fifthly and finally, honouring the Australian blue ensign. So we begin today with our opening quotable quotation, words pledged by Australian school children in the state of Victoria back in 1901. I love God and my country. I honour the flag. I will serve the King and cheerfully obey my parents, teachers and the laws. Wonderful words. So we begin today with understanding God's interest in the nations and their flags. Well, since Almighty God has laboured to establish and to sustain all of the various nations of the world, we may rightly regard their national flags as conceptually valuable in the mind of God. Flags indicate distinctive nationhood, which itself is the creation of Almighty God. So, hear these words in Scripture. When the Most High gave the nations their inheritance, when he divided all mankind, he set up boundaries for the peoples. Those words are in Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 8. And furthermore, flag utilisation, it enjoys explicit biblical warrant. As the Israelites declared, we will lift up our banners in the name of our God according to Psalm 20 and verse 5. And Almighty God himself raised a banner to be unfurled against the bow, we read in Psalm 60 and verse 4. And then we note these remarkable words in the book of Numbers as God asked his people to meet under their flags. The Israelites are to encamp around the tent of meeting some distance from it, each man under his standard with the banners of his family. So those words again. The Israelites are to camp around the tent of meeting, some distance from it, each man under his standard with the banners of his family. Remarkable words there in the book of Numbers, chapter 2 and verse 2. And then in that same portion of Holy Scripture comes the following directive given by God to the various tribes, beginning with Judah. The divisions of the camp of Judah are to encamp under their standard. With the gathering of the twelve tribes forming the shape of the cross, as they formed four groups at the north, the south, the east, and west of the camp with the tent of meeting in the middle. This is Numbers chapter 2 and verses 3 to 31. And the cross of Jesus is further prefigured for us there in the book of Numbers. It's in chapter 21 as Moses lifted up the snake on a pole and that is referenced by Jesus, of course, in John chapter 3. Thus, each of the tribes had its own flag, and the entire Israelite nation was represented by the Christian cross, centred on the tent of meeting. Crosses on the flags of several nations may therefore be 
regarded as validly indicating spirituality. And furthermore, the flag of Australia, it also denotes cultural foundations, uh, along with federal unity and regional kinship. So secondly today, interpreting the Australian national flag. Well, Christian belief, cultural foundations, federal unity and civic kinship in the region are denoted admirably by the Australian Blue Ensign. Christian ideals are wonderfully upheld on the Australian flag as it features the five stars of the Southern Cross. And this perhaps may remind us of the piercings of Jesus Christ. And the flag also, of course, depicts three crosses which unite together as Britain's Union flag or Union Jack, as it's often called. So we have the red horizontal and vertical cross of St. George set on a white background in about 1190 by King Richard the Lionheart as the flag of England. This honours a Roman soldier and martyr who lived in the 3rd century or thereabouts. And then we have the St Andrew's Cross, the white diagonal saltire as it's called with the blue background. That dates back to at least the 16th century as the flag of Scotland and it honours an apostle who according to tradition was diagonally crucified and that flag was joined to the St George's Cross in 1606. And then we have the St Patrick's Cross, the red diagonal on the white background. It's an Irish symbol which goes back to sometime before 1800 to honour the 5th century missionary to Ireland, St Patrick. And that was added to form the modern Union Jack or Union flag in 1801. Now, cultural foundations are denoted admirably as Australia's flag has the Union Jack in the honoured top left quarter. Since the language, the institutions, customs, laws, the political system and values of Britain are so fundamental to modern Australian society. And of course, federal unity is depicted by what we call the Commonwealth Star or the Federation Star with its uh, six points to indicate the six original states and one further point to denote the territories and any new states that perhaps one day may be added. Uh, this is in accord conceptually with Psalm 133 verse 1, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity. And kinship throughout the Pacific region is shown by a Union Jack in the flag of Australia and Fiji, the state flag of Hawaii, the flag of New Zealand, of Tuvalu, Pitcairn Islands and also Niue and by the Southern Cross on the flag of Samoa and of Papua New Guinea and of Tokelau as well of course as Australia and New Zealand. Although colonisation was highly problematic in Australia and in the Pacific it gave isolated people a kinship within the broader community of nations by God who sets the lonely in families we read in uh, Psalm 68 and verse 6. Turning now to developing respect for Australia's star-crossed federal blue banner as we might call it. Well the Australian people and their governments were very slow to accept and to promote the Australian blue ensign as our national flag but it was firmly embraced in the second half of the 20th century, especially during the Sydney Olympic Games in the year 2000. So flagging and rising support occurred as follows. 
Back in 1901, a federal government flag design competition, it attracted 32,823 entries, featuring a Union Jack along with a six-pointed Commonwealth star denoting the six original states, and of course the Southern Cross added. The result was announced by Prime Minister Edmund Barton, our first Prime Minister, on the 3rd of September 1901. And then in 1908, the Commonwealth or Federation star, it gained uh, an additional point to make seven. This is to indicate any new states and the territories. This was after Australia gained the territory of Papua uh, back in 1906. The Union Jack was often flown during the first half of the 20th century here in Australia as the Commonwealth authorities actively discouraged use of the Australian flag. Only the government could legally fly the Australian blue ensign as it was intended for official use and naval use while the Australian red ensign was to be flown by the merchant fleet. But the public began using the red flag on land. Well then, in 1941, Prime Minister Robert Menzies commended the blue flag as a national emblem. And then in 1953, the Flag Act recognised the blue ensign as the national flag of Australia. Then in 1981, Ausflag was formed so as to seek popular support for a new flag. And then in 1983, the Australian National Flag Association was formed to defend the existing Australian flag. Then in 1993, the Australian flag was removed from the Prime Minister's official car during a period of some serious uncertainty about the Australian identity. And then in 1995, the Aboriginal flag was officially proclaimed as a flag of Australia. And then in 1996, the Australian flag was returned to the Prime Minister's uh, official car. And also in that year, Australian National Flag Day, that's each 3rd of September, it was proclaimed. And the Flag Act of 1953 was modified so that any proposal to change the flag would require a majority of all the electors voting. And then in the year 2000, the flag obtained popular favour as it flew proudly at the Sydney Olympic Games and we did so well. And then finally in the year 2004, the federal government required all schools to fly Australia's national flag using a functional flagpole as a condition of public funding as of the year 2005. Turning now to promoting the Australian national flag. As the hearts and the minds of successive generations are powerfully shaped by signs and by symbols, the meaning of our national flag is enormously valuable. Love for the nation and for God who makes nations great, according to the book of Job, chapter 12, verse 23. This may occur as individuals and, and families, churches and community groups fly the Australian national flag. Families could include a flag ceremony as part of their daily Christian devotions homes and church grounds, civic centres may feature functional flagpoles. Children may praise God by waving various flags during worship services. Students in school assemblies may face the flag as they sing the Australian National Anthem. Congregations might like to provide hand flags as a gift at citizenship ceremonies. And then of course the following annual events, Australia Day, 26th of January, Anzac Day, the 25th of April, National Flag Day, 
the 3rd of September, Citizenship Day on the 17th of September, and of course Remembrance Day the 11th of November, these may be flagged and commemorated particularly as outreach activities by Christian groups. And finally today, honouring the Australian Blue Ensign. Well, since opponents of national flags in general and of the Australian Blue Ensign in particular, since they may gradually be gently persuaded about the goodness of nations and the flags that denote them, it's important for Christians to speak in defence of the national symbol. So teachers may be cautioned against asking children to redesign the Australian flag. Uh, students can be taught not to misuse the flag, that is by placing it on footwear or even worse as a tattoo. Schools and churches may learn and retell the wonderful story of Federation with its various elements of Christian foundation as a witness and as a celebration of nationhood. Of course, the Australian flag should be raised at dawn and then lowered at sunset, or if it's left overnight, it should be illuminated. The flag should not touch the ground, nor be treated carelessly. And whenever the flag is displayed vertically, the Union Jack should remain in the top left position of respect. This wonderfully gives uh, an, a, a civic appropriation to the fifth commandment, honour your father and your mother, according to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 12. All who fly the flag may wonderfully rejoice that it accords with our national Christian foundations, humbly relying on the blessing of Almighty God as declared in the preamble to the Commonwealth Constitution. May we fly our flags prayerfully as we prepare the way for the people and raise a banner for the nations according to Isaiah chapter 62 and verse 10, anticipating the coming Messiah who will stand as a banner to which the nations will rally. Again, it's Isaiah this time, the 11th chapter. Let us always remember, better to light a candle than curse the darkness. I'm David DeLima. Cheerio.